Well, today, you look at the U.S. market. It was funny, I was um, talking to somebody who said, a pension, he said, well, U.S. is, is you know, expensive. The market's expensive. I think there's probably growth there, but the market's expensive. And I said, well, you know, actually, it's the highest ever concentration of the top five companies. Uh, this year to date, through July, the top 10 companies in the S&P 500 accounted for 82% of returns. Top five companies have a, a PE of 49. The, all the rest of the S&P 500 have a PE of 14.7. Only three sectors this year have actually had positive performance. Jenny, it's wonderful to have you uh, with us. Uh, you just uh, hopped over from Singapore. You're here today at the World Knowledge Forum. Lots to talk about within the next uh, 40 minutes. Uh, we seems to be we are living in a world of perpetual crisis. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we've had the pandemic, of course, major disruption. Uh, we, we are having the war in Ukraine and its uh, global uh, ramification. Um, inflationary pressures uh, on pretty much in the entire global um, population. Before we get down to the nuts and bolts and into a more specific uh, question, uh, what is your assessment uh, that we're in right now, the global assessment as one of the leading managers out there? Well, I mean, as you said, I, I think there's been, you know, obviously the, probably the biggest driver of um, what I think are both investment opportunities and threats and change is what you say on the geopolitical side, right? So you look at Russia, Ukraine, I don't think anybody believes there's a solution in the near term. Uh, and obviously the impact that has on energy, food security, um, you know, we had a very mild winter last year in Europe. Uh, let's hope for another one this year. Uh, and, and coming out of the pandemic, I mean, one of the trends that you saw, and so that's obviously affected oil prices and inflation and others, right? And so that looks like that's kind of a new normal. And then you, you look at COVID, and I think what companies and countries saw is that they, their supply chain really mattered. And, and so you see three trends on supply chain. One, you know, the China plus one. I think a lot of people say, well, they'll diversify out of China. I don't think it's diversifying out. It's adding one to supplement in case there are any disruptions. The second is uh, what we're calling friend shoring. So because you have US-China um, tensions, there's almost alliances being created. So people are sort of playing on one side or the other, or they're playing right in the middle and realizing the power of being kind of in the middle, like the Middle East, I think, is doing. And so in the French shoring, you see things like, you know, the Taiwanese chip maker uh, putting $5 billion in Japan to build, a, you know, a chip factory. Now that is not because Japan is particularly cheap and they're going to get, you know, cheap production. It's because Japan uh, is under the the, uh, the defense umbrella essentially of the U.S., right? So that's the French shoring. And then the near shoring, either literally near, so Mexico to the United States, and you see a lot of automotive uh, makers um, leveraging that kind of near location, um, but also a desire to bring back domestic production. So you control a lot more yourself. You see in, in Korea the K-CHIP Act. Um, so I think those are big trends that uh, you know, have come out of kind of the geopolitical side. And then, of course, you know, I think um, climate uh, energy transition, climate change and the recognition of these extreme weather events uh, and the need to invest in uh, other sources of uh, and diversification of energy. So I think those are the big themes. And then, of course, interest rates and inflation um, that are really any any investor is trying to figure out how to navigate and and end up on the winning side of this. Investors and uh, global leaders for that matter, leaders, of course. Right. Uh, many themes that uh, have to be paid attention to that uh, take up a lot of time and resources and attention and uh, sometimes need to be tackled simultaneously mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, have a positive outcome. I'm sure there are many uh, managers, investors here in this uh, audience uh, right now. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how you transformed your company uh, since taking over as CEO. 
CEO in February 2020. You, of course, you led the Leg Mason uh, acquisition, the biggest deal in your company's 75-year history, and also one of the largest in the entire industry. No easy feat by any stretch of the imagination. Now, there have also been other transactions that followed, obviously, including acquisitions and strategic investments. Um, can you talk a little bit about your rationale for this strategy. When you're looking for trends, what are you seeking to address? Uh, what is your ultimate vision here? So, in the asset management industry, we saw, um, I'd say there's kind of three big categories or trends that we were, uh, we've done 10 acquisitions the last three years, and they fall into one of those buckets. So the first was this recognition, we always call it filling product gaps, but it's a recognition that there's just more and more assets staying in the private markets. Um, and many people would say, well, private equity, this just massive amount raised and allocated to private equity was because interest rates were low. But the reality is there's a real desire not to be public uh, anymore. There's a lot more restrictions on being public and the pressure for quarterly earnings makes it in times of great technological innovation where you need to be investing for things that may not pay off for seven to 10 years, it can be hard when you have those quarterly pressures. So um, on the private equity side today, there are half the number of US public equity companies than there were in 2000. Uh, in, in 2000, the average company went public after three years. 2019, they went public nine to 10 years. By 2022, it was 14 to 15 years, mm -hmm. right? And so because the money exists there, there's just a desire for people to be able to stay uh, private. Second piece is private credit. Mm -hmm. Massive growth in private credit mm -hmm. because essentially coming out of the, uh, the global financial crisis, global regulators put more re you know, capital restrictions on banks. And so banks are preserving their capital for their best clients, which has essentially created this I'll call it shadow banking, created this, this uh, private credit business. And with um, things like the Silicon Valley Bank crisis mm -hmm. that happened in the US, what are you seeing? The reaction is more capital controls, which means there's gonna be less lending from banks, mm -hmm. you know, more, uh, more growth in the private credit space. After the financial crisis, the many regulators said, we want more transparency in the distribution fees, the advisory fees that are paid. Um, and so you move from what was traditionally commission-based sales of asset management products to fee-based. Well, when you went to fee-based, suddenly the client is seeing every month that they're paying their financial advisor. And so they're looking at their advisor and saying, well, all you're doing is getting investment returns. And by the way, index must be really easy. So why am I paying you for that? So it made the financial advisor be much more of a wealth manager. And so your average financial advisor, and again, you see this trend growing in markets that never had even really that kind of individual financial advisor, where the, the advisor's becoming really a counselor, uh, you know, doing financial planning, tax planning, uh, estate planning even. And so we've invested in tools and that's where being located and headquartered in Silicon Valley has been very powerful for us mm -hmm. because as these startups are coming along to address some of these needs, that's been an area of acquisition for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, um, you know, Franklin Templeton has clients in 160 countries. Mm -hmm. And what you find is there's always a home bias towards people want to put their first dollars towards their you know, own, own market. Uh, and about 80% of flows tend to go to the home market. So we like to have local asset management and we've always been, you know, we've been in Korea over 25 years um, with local asset management. Uh, and we just think that's an important place to be if you're really trying to be a global asset manager. If we are talking about uh, investments and, and obviously you are at the front uh, of, of uh, this movement, um, for the average person on the street, for, for perhaps the people here in the audience or those watching us uh, online, um, what, what advice would you dispense? What, what advice would you share with them in times like these as far as personal private investments are concerned for people who have, uh, say, average incomes? Yeah. So, first of all, I think the, the one thing that is tried and true over and over mm is diversified portfolio. Mm. You never know, and so you have to make sure that you have a diversified portfolio. Um, I worry a little bit, now we're an active shop, so I'll talk my book a little bit, but genuinely, there is not enough talk about how risk can increase 
in a passive portfolio. Market beta, you know, I always say that if you measure beta as, or if you measure risk as volatility as one portion of risk, think about the day Tesla was added to the S&P 500. Nobody talked about how the volatility of the S&P just increased dramatically, right? Well, today, you look at the U.S. market. It was funny, I was um, talking to somebody who said, a pension, he said, well, U.S. is, is you know, expensive. The market's expensive. I think there's probably growth there, but the market's expensive. And I said, well, you know, actually, it's the highest ever concentration of the top five companies. Uh, this year to date, through July, the top 10 companies in the S&P 500 accounted for 82% of returns. Mm -hmm. Top five companies have a, a PE of 49. The, all the rest of the S&P 500 have a PE of 14.7. Only three sectors this year have actually had positive performance. So, being, so you have to look at that today and say, wow, I might want to take a little risk off on, on that side, on some of these big companies that have, you know, that the PEs priced in for massive amount of growth, and they're so big now, it's hard to, to see. And you, you look at actually what just happened with Apple when uh, China came out and said, well, we're not going to let government employees use the iPhone. Uh, you know, I think, I think it was 250 billion came out of their market cap, right? So there's, there's a little bit more risk and it's harder to sustain those growth. So, you know, understanding in a portfolio, um, that diversification, because sometimes you end up in a passive portfolio being very much, much concentrated. I think that's been a trend over the last decade.